Our next speaker is Phil Graham. Phil is from the New South Wales DPI. He's a technical specialist in grazing systems at YAS. <clears throat> Phil has 34 years in agricultural extension. The last 24 years at YAS as a livestock officer in sheep and wool. During this period, he's been involved with develop and delivery of ProGraze and ProGraze Plus, wool marketing workshops, features and options, on-farm fibre measurement, stock plan, long-term stocking rate trials, fish and phosphorus use, and manage the New South Wales component of the SLA 2030 project. Welcome, Phil. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I've been asked to talk about two factors today. So the first bit's going to be looking into the future. Um, I was interested to hear your, your, your numbers about people's views of climate. Um, that's a bit more optimistic than what we've been finding as we've gone round. And the second part of my talk's um, about carbon. So um, the first part was a, it was a national project and in fact there was, a, there was work, the same work was done in Victoria and in fact one of the Victorian DPI members are here today. Um, it was a project called Southern Livestock Adaptation 2030 and it was looking at what's the potential impact to livestock industries in the year 2030. Part of the project looked at 2050 and 2070 but I'm not talking about that today. All the parties you can see down the bottom there. If we're going to look into the future, there's only one way to do it, and that's a model. Now, straight away, as soon as people use the word model, they say, well, what a load of crap. I'd just like to put in context, every one of you who have been on the land for a while has got a lot of experience. You've got that experience by making observations and interpretations of what you've seen over time. What do we do when we set up a model? We get data from what's actually happened. We look at the relationships between that and we put it into equations. Quite frankly, there is very, very little difference between what you people have done in your mind for 10, 15, 20, and I won't go on for the rest of the audience, and what we do in a model. Our experience is based on the same principles as we use with modelling. Grass grow is the model. It picks up climate data, daily weather data, temperature data. It picks up pasture parameters that are relevant to that location. It picks up soil characteristics which are relevant to the location where we do the work. We put a livestock operation in there which is applicable to the area we went to, that, so that was either sheep or beef, using the appropriate calving or lambing time, shearing dates, selling strategies and all that. And we put a few dollars and cents in to try and put some economics on it. So what did we do? In this project, we go and select a location where we can get appropriate weather and, and um, soil data. And then we ran for that soil, that pasture, we picked up the historical weather data for the period you see up there, 1970 to 2000, and we ran that as, as the base. So in the talk, I'm going to talk about base. Base is the period 1970 to 2000. Now, we, we grabbed some data out of that base runs in terms of pasture production, stocking rates, dollars, issues about ground cover. One issue is with any model, and all models have this limitation. No pasture model kills a perennial grass in the model. So one of the ways we get around that is we set ground cover rules. So we're setting a ground cover rule for two reasons. To cover the limitation of the model, but also for NRM outcomes. And the ground cover rule we use, and the, the percentage um, ground cover varied a bit between locations, but for 70% of years, the minimum ground cover in a year was not to go, go below 70%. Now, 70% ground cover is a figure often used by a lot of CMAs. Put that another way, that means for the 30 years we did the work, the ground cover was only was above 70% for, for 92 weeks of that whole, 92% of the weeks for the 30 years. Right? So we've set the system up that we are protecting the pasture and the resource. We then ran that data for the period 2000 to 2009 because if we put up data for the 1970 to 2000, doesn't matter how long you've been on the land, you've got no real understanding of what the production parameters were for that period. It was too long ago and it's a too big a period. So we used the 2000 to 2009 because that's a period that people can remember. So the groups we worked with at that point, they had to say that the information we'd put up was relevant to their location, their industry. If the group said no, we went back to the drawing boards and if we couldn't get them saying yes, we walked away. So one group at Walkill, we walked away because we could never match. So producers have been involved in this process. Then what do we do? We run exactly the same system, same pasture, same soils, 
Same livestock. So we've not allowed no genetic improvement in livestock, so that's a limitation, but we've, we kept everything the same. And all we did was we grabbed weather data, daily weather data, for the period 2030. Now, to do that, we have to use these things called global circulation models. We used four. They were the four global circulation models that did the best job of hindcasting Australia's climate in the period 1970 to 2000, and they, what the model said and what really happened, there was a 70% agreement, so they're not rubbish. There are some GCMs that are rubbish. They, they only tidied up 30% of what actually happened, but they're still pictures in the future. And the other thing we did is we increased CO2, because you've most likely heard about it that as CO2 levels glow up, plants become more water efficient. So we want to capture that effect. That's a positive. So we used the same ground cover rules as we had before, so that how, how um, the degree of grazing the property is, it's, is the same between the future and the past. We run it, we get an idea of what the impacts, and then we look at what can we change in that system to make a difference. Now here's um, some data on, so the, uh, on your left is the, um, the leaf water loss. So you'll see three lines, blue, red and green. The blues C3, the reds legumes and the greens C4 plants. And as CO2, which is on the bottom, goes up, water loss out of the, the leaf decreases. The plant becomes more water efficient. And on the, your right-hand side is the rate of photosynthesis. As CO2 goes up, C3 plants will, in fact, photosynthesize quicker. C4 plants won't, because they learnt these mechanisms thousands and thousands of years ago, and they've already got the advantage. They're not going to benefit. So we do get a benefit in the species we have down here from CO2 levels. This is for Lockhart. The blue dots are historical annual rainfall from 1960 to 2010. The red dots are 120 years of 2030 rainfall. Four GCMs, and we run 30 years for each GCM, so that's how we get the 120. If we look at that, the spread of the blue dots and the red dots is the same. We agree? The big, on uh, your right-hand side, the big blue dots, the average of the blues, the, red, the big red is the average of the red. So for Lockhart, there's very little difference in rainfall in 2030 compared to history, and the variation isn't any different. We do that for every, every location, we get the same effect, except normally the gap's a little bit bigger. Maximum temperature, a bit different to the rainfall, in that we'll see the red dots are starting to move slightly out of the blue, blue dots. Same sort of range, except the temperature's just gone up a little bit. And if we do it for minimum temperature, the same thing. Interestingly enough, as we've gone round the locations in southern New South Wales, the biggest difference occurs with minimum temperatures rather than maximum temperatures. And if we look at what's happened over the last 30 years, the biggest change in temperature has been with minimum temperatures, not maximum temperatures. And I'd ask every one of us, how well do we really appreciate what happens with minimum temperatures? Not very much, because we're asleep. We tend to pay more attention to what happens to maximums, but in fact the biggest movement so far has been in min minimum. So, there are a number of locations. You can pick the ones that are relevant to you. We've basically, I've gone from east to west across southern New South Wales. The first column is the base period. The black numbers is rainfall. The red numbers is mean temperature. The middle column is for the period 2000 to 2009. And the 2030 is the average of the four GCMs, again, for rainfall and temperature. In all cases, rainfall was lower in the 2000 to 2009 period than forecast for 2030. But there is an increasing movement in temperature between across the trends. So it's those sort of rainfall data, temperature data, that we've now put into the model to generate what I'm going to show you now. For Holbrook, there's pasture growth. The blue bars are the historical monthly pasture growth. The four lines are the four GCMs. I suppose the major feature to me that stands out is in wintertime. The, the four lines are above the four blue bars. And again, wherever we go, we see the same thing. As we go forward, winter growth rates are going to go up. Slight increase in temperature 
At present, temperature is the limiting factor in winter, not moisture, so growth rate goes up. The higher your altitude, the bigger the impact. A uh, bit tougher in autumn, tends to cut off a little bit earlier in spring. Now here are a number of locations, slightly wider than I had before. These are the averages, this is for 2030, the first column headed annual pasture, that figure in there is a percentage figure. So how you read that is, say for Yass, that in 2030 the average of the four GCMs was that pasture production would be 93% of what it was in the base period. So if we go to Holbrook, pasture production in 2030 will be 99% of what it was in the base period. Narandra drops more. We then go to the next column. It, that's, that's a percentage figure again to the base period. This is what's happening in the stocking rate. So yes, we were back 7% on pasture growth, but to maintain that ground cover rule that we had, we had to drop stocking rate, and in fact our stocking rates dropped to 70%. And you'll see the, the relevant figures as you go down the column. Dollar per hectare is, we've kept prices and costs constant. What's the impact on profit per hectare? And there is overhead costs in here. That, that because that reduced stocking rate, and we've, we've got the overhead costs, profits come back. Um, I can't explain why Narandra is hit as hard as it is, but that was the case. That's been looked at many times. And the letter next to it indicates whether it was a wool operation, a lamb operation, or a cattle operation that was run at those different systems. So I think one thing to take out of, of this is um, if you see people making comments on annual pasture production as an indicator of impact of into the future, ignore it because it's a bloody poor indicator. So what's causing it? We're getting a shorter pasture growing season. We're growing more grass in winter, but we get, we're starting a bit later and we're finishing a bit earlier, which is leading to increased problems with ground cover. The way we've tended to manage ground cover is to decrease stocking rate. That's le leading to resulting decrease in pasture production. If we do nothing, okay? This is if we do nothing into the future. Now, but the simple fact is we can do things, and now these are just going to be a range of adaptations from different locations. So this one is for a cattle operation. The first column's Holbrook, the second column's Tumbarumba. So business as usual, Brian Cummings changed nothing between the, um, the models, and those figures are profit on a dollar per hectare basis for the worst model, for the worst GCM. If we change calving date, at Holbrook, you don't worry about doing it. Tumbarumba, some slight advantage. Uh, if we use drought lots in the years that, are, that it's needed, um, we start seeing some better, it doesn't matter at Holbrook, uh, at Tumbarumba, drought lots at Tumbarumba weren't moving you anywhere, but it was an advantage at Holbrook. If we wean calves at four months of age and then feed them, we're seeing at Holbrook that's had a substantial increase in, in operating profit. So there are changes, and this is not by any means a complete list. There's a range of other things. But all I'm trying to give you an idea is we can, go, we can start going into this and we can start making changes that people have thought about. And they're changes that people in Holbrook suggested Brian to look at. The other thing to take out of that, just because something works well at one, one location doesn't automatically mean it's going to work well in another location. Um, this is at Cootamundra. This is a, um, a lamb and a, both a wool and a um, lamb operation. So the, the, the wool operation where the merinos are sold off, the impact of, on the profit went from 100 back to 72%. So it got knocked by 28%. If we use a feedlot for the, the breeding ewes in the years that are required and the cost of the grains being included of that, we recover more than half of that loss. We get back to 90% of our base period. Um, the prime lamb operation at Cooter isn't going to be hit quite as much. If we now keep, which is to some degrees putting in reality, if we, have, if we keep genetic improvement going on between now and 2030, so by the time we get to 2030, we're running a more efficient animal than we're running today. In other words, turn off rates of lamb at the same way it's been reduced by 10 days, we're back to 92%. If we do a bit of work on dressing percentage, as well as the, the growth rate, we're now back to 
And if we combine the feedlot and genetics, because they're not mutually exclusive, we're now getting a number which is better than our base period. So, genetic improvement between now and 2030 is a very important tool for us managing pressures that are coming into the system, and that applies regardless of your enterprise. This is um, feedlot at gas. I suppose the thing I really want to put up there, here's a graph where I've split the four GCMs up separately. So the German model was always the hardest. The UK model was always the best. Um, and that was the major difference there was rainfall. Temperature was a lot closer. It was rainfall that was apart. Just look at the difference in profit between the, the German model at 59 and the UK model at 242. The thing that concerned me or worried me doing this work very small changes in temperature and rainfall, and there were some changes in distribution in the year, started having a big impact on, on the dollar result we got. So everything else I'm showing is average, and sometimes the averages look okay. But if things tended, ended up being a bit worse than the average, the story wasn't quite as rosy as these figures might have led on. Um, again, this is yes for a wool operation. A couple of things. The third one down is trading only. So. One of the comments I hear is, um, oh, climate change will move out of breeding, will move to trading. Well, there's only a very small percentage of the industry can do that. Um, but if you do do it, the result looks good. 89% instead of 70, instead of 60%. So, so that's a big advance. But you only had to be down 10%. I'll make up a number. Let's say that trading operation had to buy a thousand units in a year to keep it, keep the property stocked and going. If they could only buy 900 units instead of the 1,000, that figure drops from 89% to 65%. That trading figure is very, very sensitive that you'll be able to buy the stock at the right price to keep the, the stocking pressure up. So quite frankly, that trading one has got a very large risk around it. Um, the feedlot and, and genetics there, down at 107%. So that genetics is, is the genetics of wool. Again, we're seeing a benefit. The last one I put up was the genetics in, in meat growth. We get benefits. Uh, Tamora and Tamora and Narandra, the roll, see Narandra before was sitting at 70, uh, it was down at 12%. A summer feedlot at Narandra is going to make a hell of an important tool in the future at being able to recover some of that pressure that's been put on. There's a range of cattle operations, Holbrook, Tumbarumba, Grenfell, Woodstock, up near uh, Orange, Mossvale. And again, I suppose the thing I was just putting up there that there's a range between the models. So I've been showing averages, but again, this, this comment that if we move a bit harder than what we think, there's a few warning signs there. And one of the other important things that if you've got an operation which today isn't very good, i.e. Grenfell, well, you can be very sure that in the future is that the hole's only get, going to get bigger. So to, to fit into something with Daniel and, and David were talking about, I agree with, or agree with the, the comments they made about um, what's important now in driving profit. In doing these runs, we've already set these farms up at the optimum stocking rate. So putting more fertiliser and increased stocking rate isn't an option on these. We're already, we're already at that level and we're going ahead. If a property is already running at half rat power, as I say, the biggest thing you can do into the future is move it from half rat power to full rat power. What's the value to the, the producers? Um, the thing that got, I've got back over the three years of doing this is one of the comments producers have come back and said, well, the discussion about climate change, which is this bloody terrible... Word. There's a, there's a rumour that we are actually had a discussion as a nation on climate change. If what we've had is a discussion, I'd, I'd I hate to see what an argument is. We haven't had a discussion. We've just had a whole lot of useless comments thrown out in media which tells it no one anything. Um, we've tried to bring climate change in a language that people understand. I think we've provided a base from which producers can assess change and pathways they might want to go. And timing's important. That was made earlier. Some of the things, some of the changes that we think would be of benefit in the future would be dumb to implement now. They need to be implemented in maybe 10 or 15 years' time. Genetics or soil fertility, uh, summer feedlots, they have a role now. And for most of you, and don't take this the wrong way, as I look around the, next, look around the room, most likely the next five to 10 years is the, the time frame a lot of you are thinking about. 
in that time frame, you will have to deal with climate variability, you will not have to deal with climate change. That's the younger members in the audience who still plan to be on the land in 2030 and 2040, where that slow, insidious drip, which is climate change, will start having an impact. Responses will vary between locations, so we can't turn around and say, everyone should go and do X, because X might work in one place and it won't work in another place. And one of the things out of this work, it's just as important to realise what's not going to give you benefit into the future as what will. And there's a website, you can see the address there. Hopefully in another two months, all the sites from around Australia, including the Victorian work, will be up on that site. Second part of the talk. I was asked to make some comments. I think the question was, is soil carbon a good indicator for soil health? I want to rely on, on the work here by a colleague of mine, Dr Warwick Badgery, uh, researcher at Orange. Warwick, in fact, gave some of this talk at Wagga the other week. And I've picked the bits and pieces out to try and answer the question. I suppose, what is um, soil organic matter? Um, it, it contains 57% carbon, so it's a large chunk of its carbon. But the incredible thing, the important thing to remember is it also contains other things. Carbon is just not sitting there by itself, it's in a compound with other nutrients. Nitrogen, sulphur, oxygen, hydrogen, phosphorus. To get soil organic carbon, you need all of those. Carbon and nitrogen come out of the air, sulphur and phosphorus do not come out of the air. They've got to come from somewhere. It's made up of decomposing, decomposed and animal material. It's not straw, dung, stubble, fallen leaves, plant roots. Most of the carbon is lost to the atmosphere via CO2 in breakdown. And I suppose the important figure to remember is that one's down the bottom. It's only 5 to 15% of the carbon that we start off with actually ends up as soil carbon. 5 to 15%. I'll keep coming back to that figure. When we're talking about soil, uh, soil carbon, if anyone, you know, there's, there's talk about soil carbon trading, um, one thing you need to realise is, is bulk density. And bulk density is just a, if you like, it's a measure of weight, of, 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 vol, of set volume of soil, a weight of it. So as the bulk density is lower, you get more air holes in it. So they're the blue areas. As bulk density goes up, there's less of them. So bulk density is something that has to be taken into account when you're walk, working out soil carbon. Because the process to work it out in, in terms of carbon per hectare is the depth of the soil, so if we're in any trading scheme, we're dealing it to 30 centimetres. The bulk density, which you can measure, but it has to be known. And the carbon content, which is the thing that you have most likely seen already. You send a soil test off for the 0 to 10 centimetres and you'll get a soil carbon figure come back as a percentage. That's the, that's the third part of the equation. What tends to happen as that soil carbon percentage goes up, bulk density goes up. Bulk, bulk density goes down. So those two, that, that, that tends to counteract your, your, the total amount of carbon you're storing. Now, the, the data I'm going to show there, I saw some um, things outside. There's a, a similar project being done in this valley. This is the Lachlan Valley, um, uh, Cowra, Forbes, Lake Congelico, Hilston. It's basically all those dots were the areas where the sampling was done. So we're in the highlands, southern tablelands, um, slopes, western. The, that's the, the pool of data. There was 350 sites in the project. First, the top one is the 0 to 10 centimetres and the bottom one's 20 to 30 centimetres in depth of profile, so that's important. So the top one, we have up the side here um, soil organic carbon stocks, tonnes per hectare. So that's going up and this is rainfall. And there's a strong relationship, that's got an R squared of, of 50.5 between rainfall. And this, is, this has been found in a lot of work done. As rainfall goes up, the ability of a soil to have carbon goes up, store carbon. But you'll notice while there's a relationship for the 0 to 10, once you get to 20 and 30, there is no relationship. All right, so we'll just bear that in mind. Now, one thing what I just talked about earlier, uh, this is rainfall. If over time 
nature's deciding it's going to move rainfall in that direction, it is putting downward pressure on soil carbon. Whether we like it or not, that's what nature's decided it's going to do. Now the influence of soil type. So there are slopes and tablelands up the top, so just two, two different uh, geographical areas within the Lachlan catchment. Three soil types. The three soil types don't matter. I never did pay attention in soil science. Um, the first column is the amount of soil carbon in tonnes per hectare in the 0 to 30 centimetre. The next column is in the 0 to 10. And then right out, number of sites that were sampled in rainfall. Very little difference in rainfall, but a substantial difference in the total pool of soil organic carbon. Not so much in the top, but overall. The issue is, and we get a similar story down below, soil types are going to influence how much soil carbon you can store. So if you're on a piece of land, that die's already been cast, you've got that soil type. It has a boundary of how far it will go. And just because someone else in another area does X and gets this result, that doesn't mean you're going to get that result because there could well be a different soil type. So rainfall is having an impact on our carbon stores in the top 10 centimetres. But once we come to the, the full soil profile, soil type is having an influence and we can't change that soil type. Soil texture, the general rule is the sandier the soil, the less it can hold store carbon. As you get more clay in the soil, the carbon figures you can go to get greater. Right? So these some are inherent characteristics of soil type. For any of those soil types, you can improve the carbon level. But if you've got a sandy soil type, you are never, never, never going to get levels that someone who has a clay soil type has. So we can't get round the underlying characteristics of soil. We can't get round the underlying influences of rainfall. What we can start doing about is what happens to what we do on that land and how much we can move things. So here's, on one of the soil types, four different systems. Crop in rotation, the pasture phase in the cropping area, permanent pastures and native vegetation. So the native vegetation sites that Warren's listed there would have been um, railway verges, cemeteries, um, areas that were locked up and haven't had agricultural influence on them which were near the permanent pasture sites. That's how they've done the, the pairing to try and get figures. Warwick will say that his figures tend to be lower than what other people have got in the literature, but that was the case. Um, uh, this is the interesting one in that if we notice the pasture in rotation has in fact got a, it's not statistically different, but a slightly lower carbon level than the crop in rotation. We get to permanent pasture, the figure goes up. When Warren, uh, Warwick sat down and analysed all the cropping um, data and he's looking for the effect of management, what they have found, the things that have jumped out on them up front, so they, these are the things that have the biggest influence. The, harder you, the longer you've got to go looking in a set of data to get something that comes out, the, the power it's got is getting less and less. So the things that came out... The sites where there was more N and P fertiliser applies we were having higher levels of soil carbon in the system and the number of years of pasture in rotation was having a major effect. They're the two things that stood out when they looked at all the cropping sites. I don't think we're going to be very surprised at that. When they went to the pasture one, again, there was a positive relationship between soil carbon and the amount of P fertiliser applied and that, that results come out uh, both in Australia a number of times with work and also overseas. It's the next one that's interesting and he's, he's still working on it. Pasture composition, the quality of material returning to the soil, utilisation for grazing, nutrient cycling. It is appearing that the quality of the material we have on the soil that is being broken down into the soil, the higher the quality, i.e. the digestibility of that material, the more of that we are getting from there into soil carbon. 
the lower the digestibility of the plant material in your pasture sitting on the soil, the less of that is going to end up in soil carbon. So if you remember at the start, the figure was 5 to 15% of carbon that was above ending up in the final system, it could well be that the higher the quality material we've got breaking down, the more of that we're going to capture. So we're going to be near the 15% end. The lower the quality of the, the material, the pasture, we're going to be at the bottom end. Now, it's complex, and Warwick's looking at it um, in detail at present. The quality of material is something that people haven't looked at in the literature before. But that's the only way he can explain some of the trends that are coming out of this database. To assess whether it's possible to build soil carbon, it's essential that wherever you are, there is an upper limit. Right? You can't build soil carbon forever. What your figures are going to be are going to be driven by your rainfall and your soil type. They're givens, and all you can do is work within that box. If you're after a figure X and your soil type isn't going to give you X, you've either got to accept that you've got to work with X minus something because that's what your soil type and climate's going to let you to get to or sell and go somewhere else. The other thing is you want to be very clear at present if you're going to make a land use change to build soil carbon that in fact that change is going to take you anywhere and I've put changing grazing management question marks up. There's been a lot of discussion over the last 10 years about different grazing managements and what they're going to do for soil carbon and, and uh, what has been the common comment about which way it's going to take us is not proving to be the case when we keep looking at a lot of sites. Every time we've gone and looked at it, long rotations, low quality food, it is not building soil carbon. In fact, we tend to find soil carbon being built by um, uh, faster rotations, higher quality food going back into the system. I can put it another way. Um, if you think of the bacteria in an animal's room and it's doing the same job as the bacteria in the soil, you put low quality food into that room and those bugs have to work a very long time with lower efficiency to break that material down. The same logic really is applying in the soil. Thank you.